Today's tourists, heading north to the rugged grandeur of the Highlands, sometimes overlook the southwest of Scotland. Here, the landscape has a very different character, and the big skies, rolling hills, and spectacular coastline were much admired by early travelers. 200 years ago, this was considered to be a challenging landscape and very much a man's world, full of unseen perils to be faced down by the brave and definitely not a place for women. At least, that's what men thought. But the ladies came anyway. They were just as eager to explore the highways and byways of Scotland as their menfolk and soon tourist guidebooks began to appear, catering for feminine tastes and sensibilities. Black's picturesque Guide to Scotland was one of the first to address a female readership. Published in 1846 by Charles and Adam Black, it became the Victorian Tourist's Bible. A copy of this fascinating guide inspired my parents to explore Scotland. Four decades on, I'm retracing some of the routes we followed as a family. Heading to the southwest, I'm on a journey with a decidedly feminine touch. Starting at the border village of Gretna Green, I'm heading west to Dumfries, taking a detour to Led Hills, travelling to the Solway coast before finishing up within sight of Ireland at Port Patrick. This is Gretna Green, just a few metres from the English border. According to Blacks, Gretna Green is a hamlet long famous for clandestine marriages. I suppose you could argue that among the first female tourists to come to Scotland were young brides who'd eloped across the border. Now, they came because under Scots law, it was possible to get married at the age of 16 without your parents' consent. And being the first village in Scotland, Gretna Green quickly became a haven for young lovers on the run. And this is where they came the now world-famous blacksmith's workshop. And it was in these plain and at first glance decidedly unromantic surroundings that the bonds of matrimony were once forged. In Scotland, lovers didn't need a priest to marry them because the law recognised any marriage made by a respectable member of the community. And traditionally, this was the blacksmith. And here at Gretna Green, anvil priests, as they were called, made a fortune forging quickie weddings right here. The first anvil priest to cater for love tourists from England was Joseph Paisley, who made a fortune marrying girl brides by striking a hammer on his anvil. But Paisley didn't cope well with success and seems to have overindulged. In later life, he was described as grossly ignorant and insufferably coarse, an overgrown mass of fat weighing at least 25 stone, who drank a good deal more than was necessary to his thirst. The tradition of the anvil priest continued up until the 1940s, when a change in the law forced them to hang up their hammers. But lovers continue to make their way here, and Gretna Green is still a big place for weddings. Amazingly, one in eight of all Scottish weddings take place in the village. Why did you choose Gretna Green? Why come to Scotland? Because we've run away. You've run away? Seriously, yeah. yeah. No one knows. <laughs> no one knows. It's no. the famous place to come. We wanted a, a, just a quiet ceremony just for us. Uh -huh. um, and we wanted to go somewhere that was you know, traditional and, and also special. <laughs> Leaving Gretna Green in a blizzard of confetti, I'm travelling further across the border in a suitably period conveyance. Much favoured by ladies as a way of getting about, the pony and trap recalls the days of early tourism and a time when females seldom, if ever, travelled alone. 
It says everything about the social position of women in those days, that they needed to be chaperoned. You see, the fair sex were considered to be too weak to cope by themselves and needed a man's chivalrous helping hand. To discover why women were considered to be so useless and how they fought back, I'm giving a lift to writer and historian Betty Haglund on the road to Dumfries. Betty, back in the 18th and 19th centuries, women weren't exactly encouraged to be adventurous travellers. I think that's true. I think there were fears that for some women, the sublimity of the landscape would be too much, that they would be overwhelmed by it, that they would be frightened by it. And get the vapours and faint. Yes. Uh -huh. They were expected to defer to their husbands. They, of course, had no independent money. Many women, of course, as well, were pregnant almost constantly throughout their married lives. Um, it was not uncommon for women to have 18 to 20 pregnancies. That limits how much you can travel. But some women did escape the domestic realm. In 1803, Dorothy Wordsworth, sister of the poet William, embarked on a celebrated tour of Scotland. Dorothy Wordsworth was traveling initially with her brother and with Samuel Coleridge who was, of course, a great friend of Dorothy and William Wordsworth. Now, how did that work out for Dorothy, travelling with two poets? My feeling is that the two poets probably wouldn't have got past Gretna Green if Dorothy hadn't been with them. Right. She was the practical one. The capable Dorothy led the poets on a literary pilgrimage through the southwest, searching for the legacy of another poet, Robert Burns. This is Dumfries, the town where Scotland's national bard lived for three years until his death. You can imagine Burns as a sort of early Elvis Presley. And just as Presley's home, Gracelands, became hallowed ground, so too did the humble home of Robert Burns when he died here in Dumfries in 1796. <laughs> The Wordsworths, like other fans of the Bard, came here in the hope of finding Burns' widow at home, or perhaps glimpsing the children. But Jean Armour wasn't in that day. Instead, the Wordsworths paid their respects at the poet's grave. But reverence for greatness can sometimes show itself in unexpected ways. Three decades after Dorothy's visit, Burns' grave was broken into. It seems almost unimaginable to us now, but in 1834, under cover of darkness, four respectable men of the town, including the newspaper editor and a surgeon, broke into Burns' tomb and removed his skull. But this seemingly macabre act of desecration was done with the highest motives to further our understanding of human genius. Megan Coyer tells me about the link between Burns and phrenology, an early science that tried to map the organs of the intellect by measuring the contours of the skull. Well, this, um, it's called an introduction to phrenology, and the front um, plate is actually really useful for illust illustrating the science, in that you can see um, there's the skull here, right. and there's a map with little numbers on it, and each uh -huh. of the numbers correspond to an individual organ. Do you think the men who came here that night were trying to further Burns' reputation to somehow bolster it and put him on a pedestal and say, here is this man and we've discovered the seat of his poetic genius? There was a great deal of interest in Burns um, because of the fact that he's a class transcendent genius, the heaven top plowman. Um, the phrenologists were very, um, very much on the side of nature over nurture. And if, if Burns could show by reading his, we could show by reading Burns's brain um, that he was naturally poetic, that would be a, a big triumph for phrenology. One organ that they particularly fixated on was his organ of benevolence was particularly large. Right. And the poem To a Mouse was one that they said illustrated that um, very nicely. Um, one that they were quite surprised about was that he had a very small organ of a mativeness. Of what? 
Amativeness, which is amativeness. Amativeness. It's the organ of sexual passion. Right. Well, that's not what I heard. I thought he was quite well endowed in that department. Um, well, according to his biography and poetry, one would think that he would have um, a large organ of amativeness. Um, but the phrenologists, um, this is this is one of the things that they're a little bit crafty with. If, if one organ was a bit small and didn't match up with the character, they could find another one that would counterbalance it. And in this case, they went to um, adhesiveness. Right. Which, uh, Does that compensate? For yes, that right. compensated. Um, it's but, nice but the small amativeness. Yeah, it's nice to know that size doesn't always matter, I suppose. <laughs> After they'd finished taking their measurements, the literary gents took a plaster cast of Byrne's skull, all to back up the claims of a highly dubious science. But if poetic genius can't be found so easily in the head, then perhaps it's in the heart after all, which is what I'm going to discover on the next leg of my journey. Just a few miles south of Dumfries is a picturesque ruin with a delightfully feminine name and feminine atmosphere. Sweetheart Abbey is a testament in stone to a woman's enduring love. Black's guidebook sets the scene, describing how Devil Giller, the wife of John Balio, erected the Abbey in 1275 as a tribute to the memory of her husband. Devil Giller's story is straight out of high romance. She was a Gaelic-speaking princess and was just 13 years of age when she married the Anglo-Norman knight John Balio. Now, when Balio died, she had his heart removed and placed in a special ornate casket which she carried around with her for the rest of her life. Devoting herself to good works, Devogilla funded the construction of this magnificent abbey and founded the famous Balliol College in Oxford. When it was time for her to depart this life, she was buried here with her husband's heart placed over her own. And ever since, this place has been known as Sweetheart Abbey. Now, this is exactly the sort of romantic story that blacks considered to be appropriate fare for a Victorian lady tourist. But for a more serious-minded and independent lady traveler like Dorothy Wordsworth, interest lay elsewhere. Leaving Sweetheart Abbey, I'm following Dorothy Wordsworth north and into the hills to a village that claims to be the highest in Scotland. This is Wanlock Head, a place not mentioned by my edition of Blacks at all. Most lady tourists were drawn to rose gardens or big country houses, but not Dorothy Wordsworth. She was more interested in the lives of the ordinary people she met on her travels. For centuries, miners worked these mineral-rich hills. In the Middle Ages, gold was extracted here, and when Dorothy visited in 1803, there were extensive silver and lead mines. Although the last mine here closed long ago, it's still possible for tourists to explore them. Guide Annie Goff takes me underground. Mind your head there, Rocky. Like Dorothy, tourists today are amazed by the dangerous and difficult conditions that so many working people, men and young boys, once had to endure. They only got paid once a year because it wasn't just mining the lead, it was smelting it and selling it overseas. They didn't get any money until that was uh, done. So they'd have to wait usually a year for their money, sometimes even two years. Well, after two so, years of that being paid? Up to two years sometimes. So everything they needed, they had to get on credit from the company store. Right. And then when they got paid at the end of the year or two years, they'd have to pay back everything they owed. They were debt slaves, really? Basically, yeah. Once you're in debt, um, you had to keep working until hopefully eventually you could pay everything back. It's hard for us to comprehend the lives that were lived down here in the cold and the dark, and definitely not the sort of thing you'd expect an 18th century lady to be interested in. But Dorothy Wordsworth had broken the mould, becoming a pioneering industrial tourist. Back in the open air, I reflect on the grim conditions underground, 
and on the equally grim challenge faced by many early tourists to Scotland, the traditional Scotch menu. When Dorothy Wordsworth came to Scotland in 1803, the country wasn't really geared up to cater for the tastes of southern tourists. Hotels were few and far between, and the food presented something of a challenge for more sophisticated palates. In other words, it was hard to stomach. But Dorothy Wordsworth was made of sterner stuff. When male stomachs turned, she tucked in. The first dish was too Scottish, a boiled sheep's head with a hair singed off, and I ate heartily of it. Yum, yum. Fortunately, the Scottish tourist menu has changed a good deal since Dorothy's day, and to recapture the flavour of our collective past, I'm in the kitchen of cookery writer Sue Lawrence. Now, Sue, a cod's head's not particularly appetising. What's going on here? Well, it's for a dish called crappet heed, a very old traditional dish, uh, basically right. stuffed head, and we're Crap using it. a cod one. Crappet means to stuff. Right. Yeah. Crappet heed is a waste not, want not sort of dish that even makes use of the eyes of the fish. They are edible. You can actually poach them in right. the liquor, and they're supposed to be like soft boiled eggs. Now, why would anyone want to eat a cod's head? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not the first thing that comes to I know, me. I know. Well, I mean, a, a couple of things. First of all, it's sort of called a piscatorial haggis, so it's a right. fishy haggis. So it, it was through necessity. Right. You know, people were hungry. What would you do? We would just fling it out now, probably. Uh -huh. They wouldn't have done the olden days. And what did they have nearby? They had oatmeal. And you mix the liver, either from the cod or preferably right. haddock, because right. cod's liver it tends to be full of horrible little worms, right. which is fine, but you've just got to get right. rid of them. And you mix that with equal quantities of oatmeal, uh -huh. season it, and stuff it in the head. This recipe is not for the faint-hearted, and just combining the ingredients requires a strong constitution. You're meant to go with your hands. I will have to do that yeah, later, I, I, but at this yes. stage... I mean, you really are putting together some of the most unpleasant and unlikely ingredients in this dish. Exactly. Fish eyes and ming and liver. Oh, dear. Right, OK, I think we'll get, <laughs> to, the, I think we'll get to the stuffing now with my hands. <laughs> Very brave. <laughs> and yeah. stuff it and get it right in there. I mean, I suppose that, you know, if I, I'm now thinking it's like the Christmas turkey, so it's right. fine. Uh -huh. After Sue has worked her magic, she boils the cod's head for 30 minutes and then lets it cool before presenting me with crapit heed in all its glory. Which part would you recommend I, I sample first? I think probably this bit of the cheek, would, the cheek would be lovely. And if you want to have a wee no. bit of that, maybe with some of the stuffing, that uh, should really? be... Some yes. of the stuffing as well? Yes, right. that should be utterly delicious, I would have thought. Right, so there's a little bit maybe. of the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pop it in my mouth. Yeah, yeah, it should be, it should be fine. It should be fine. I'll just join you in that. It's fine. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't so actually then... taste of anything at all. No. It's like a bit of cold fish. Mm -hmm. mm. So now it's the rather challenging stuffing with the liver. Right, OK, you really want me to try this? Yes. From the um, mm -hmm. stuffing that's protruding through From the eye, eye sockets. Socket. Yeah, I think that's... Scrummy, yummy, yummy yes. doos. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. It's not bad, is it? It's definitely liverish, though, mm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. You okay? I'm just yeah, remembering drink of water. <laughs> how we prepared it. Mm. Mm. It's really mm. quite strong that liver taste, mm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. It still could be worse. There could be worms in it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have said that, Sue. So. Oh dear. To give my taste buds a chance to recover from the shock of crap at heed, I head for the hills where I fill my lungs with fresh, clean air. It's great to be outside. In Victorian times, few women ventured into this landscape. And although the mountains here are not as high as in the highlands, they're still challenging, which is why the ladies were encouraged to stay at home. In Glen Truel, high in the Galloway Hills, I meet up with Fran Lutz, who runs classes to encourage women to get more out of this beautiful countryside. So it's pretty detailed in this map, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, this scale shows a lot. So it shows a track going off, which leads to the house over there uh -huh. that you can yeah. see. Having got our bearings, we set out on a hike through picture-perfect woods and hills. Fran, do you think that men and women really appreciate nature differently? I think there are differences. Um, I think women enjoy just 
savouring that environment that they're in a little bit more. Uh -huh. um, often when I've gone out with my male friends, it's a bit of a clock watch job and we've got this destination, right. this goal that uh -huh. we're going to do today. We're going to go and conquer um, uh -huh. this, this right. hill um, and they just charge off. Not all of them, but quite a few, whereas women tend to savour it a bit more. Do you think a lot of women feel that um, they're missing out or do you think that a lot of women are possibly missing out on this experience? I think so. When, when I've taken women who haven't um, had much experience of being out in the great outdoors, uh -huh. they just love it. I mean, they do find it literally awe-inspiring. Right. That appreciation of just even the tiny little things, but just away from the hustle and bustle and um, just enjoying the beauty and the size of it all, uh -huh. yeah. Having tramped for hours, I feel the need to cool my feet. So leaving the ladies to navigate home, I make my own way to the coast. One of the simplest holiday pastimes has to be paddling in the sea, where you can luxuriate in salt water and let the sand tickle over your toes. But down on the Solway coast here, you're faced with a bit of a problem because when the tide goes out, it leaves behind miles and miles and miles of thick, sticky mud. But for some people, this is absolutely ideal. Squelching my way across a huge expanse of warm, oozing mud, I meet up with Vivian Brown, who's a big fan of the ancient and honourable spot of floundering, when folk go barefoot in search of the humble flatfish. Yuck, this is really, really muddy. <laughs> you enjoying this? <laughs> I don't think it's unpleasant. <laughs> is, it, is, this, is this what uh, flounderers look for when they come tramping for flounders? A lot of mud? A lot of mud, that's, that's the main part of it. The flounders are kind of secondary, I think. But what are we looking for? How do we catch a flounder? You stand on them, and, but your natural instinct, if you stand on a fish, obviously, is to, <laughs> to jump away. To jump away. <laughs> so you've got to be really brave and keep your, your foot on right. and then pick it up. So you don't spear them? No, we're not allowed to do that anymore. So you don't eat them then? People have eaten them in the past, but we now return the fish to the water uh -huh. afterwards. Right. Yes. Is that just to be kind to flounders? To be kind to flounders, right, right. yes. And then go home for a fish tea? That's right, fish fingers. <laughs> <laughs> it's a strange old world. <laughs> Absolutely. This part of the Solway coast was for many years famous for holding a mass flounder tramping competition. It was a major event, attracting hundreds of eager entrants and has recently been revived. This was really a big event. It was, passing. yeah. Well, this is the World Championship. Really? Yes, people nice. come from all over the world. Are there other international venues that are famous for flounder tramping? No, nope, this, is, this, is, this the is the only it. one. This is it. <laughs> so as a, an experienced flounder tramper, you must know the best spots, really. You must... Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I'm relying on your native instinct here right. to lead me to catch the biggest flounder ever caught on the Solway <laughs> coast. As we reach our floundering hunting ground, I'm having second thoughts about this peculiar spot. So it's a really kind of odd experience, Vivian. We're probing into this mud, into this silt, and we can't really see what we're doing. It's all by touch, and it's really quite disgusting. <laughs> Ugh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I Was put that... my foot on something there. Uh... Ugh. I felt... Ugh. <laughs> Despite many fishy false alarms, my untrained toes failed to locate the elusive flounder. Now, that tide, is it coming in or is it going out? It's coming in. Right. Yeah. So we better not get cut off by the tide. Then, nope. That would be a disaster. That would be just terrible. <laughs> we'd just have to spend the day here. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd have to swim. <laughs> Floundering with Vivian has whetted my appetite for the hunt. Travelling along the coast, I take the opportunity to try my luck in deeper waters. The Solway Firth provides some of the finest sea angling anywhere in Europe. I'm in the capable hands of Christine Burratt, who I hope is going to help me land a whopper. To get me in the mood, we stop for a spot of mackerel fishing and it's not long before my rod is twitching. 
Oh, something's biting in here. Oh, there you go. Have you got something? Have you got something? Oh, you have. Yeah, You've got, got mackerel coming here. up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, we've got them as well. Oh, I've got a beauty. Woo! -hoo. I've got a beauty. <laughs> there we are. Look at that. There you go. You've got one as well. Oh, I've got two. You've got two. I think you beat me. <laughs> you beat me. I mean, what's the normal kind of protocol for this sort of thing? I mean, do, do you take a lot of fish back to eat? Well, no, we try and put everything back, you know. Uh-huh. Why is that? Uh, well, I thought the point of fishing was to take something <laughs> home for your team. Not always, not always. It's sport fishing, really, around here. Yeah. Most anglers want to help conserve depleted fish stocks, so returning their catch makes perfect sense. But fishing is an extremely popular pastime, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's grown as well. Yeah. And you're finding more and more women getting involved as well now. Yeah? Yeah. I've got one, got one, got one. Here we go. I mean, have you got Sip this the time then, Paul? A lot, I think. You got a full string, have you? Not necessarily a full string. Ooh, oh no, I've know. got four. One, yeah. two, I've got four. Four fish coming aboard. One, two, three. Ugh. What a weight! <laughs> the mackerel are coming thick and fast, but it's time to move on to try for a fish that's considered to be a more sporting catch: the pollock. So basically, I'm just sitting here watching this float bob up and down. Yeah. And that's the sport part. That's the sport. Well, that's a relaxing part. It's very relaxing. Yeah, it's very yeah. relaxing, yeah. especially in a day like this, isn't it? I'm just wondering, Christine, if there's um, a difference, really, a difference of approach between men and women to the art of fishing. To the art of fishing. Yeah. Well, I think all women just like to beat the men. That's one thing, isn't really? it? Yeah. So oh, you're yeah. quite competitive. Oh, we're very competitive, yeah. yeah. Christine has just thrown down the gauntlet, and I can't resist the challenge to beat her at her own game by catching my whopper. Got him. How do you feel if you're fighting? Yeah. Oh. Trying to this is the sport. The oh. It's huge. That's it. This is a big one. Look it's at that. It's a better one, yeah. This is a cracker. Well done. <laughs> wow. How about that for your tea? Look at this one. Can I get your rod tip up? Enormous. Look at the size of that. Wow, look at that. Look at this beauty. <laughs> and look at the man that got it, eh? But just seconds later, Christine catches a whopper of her own. Uh -huh. Aha! <laughs> that is bigger than yours. I don't think so, Christine. I think mine was considerably bigger than that. I know. Think... Okay, then, right. <laughs> What more fitting end to a grand day out than to see our Pollock swim away to his fishy home. I'm coming to the end of my grand tour of the South West, which started on the border with England and finishes within sight of Ireland. This is Port Patrick. Black's guidebook explains that the town owes its name to a visit from St. Patrick, who is said to have stepped ashore one day. It's not surprising that Port Patrick has so many Irish connections. It's just 21 miles from the Irish coast, and for centuries there's been a constant stream of people going backwards and forwards across the sea. Being so close to Ireland, Port Patrick became the Gretna Green of the Far West. And in the 18th century, love struck runaways from the Emerald Isle, made their way here by boat, and got married in a fever, which is a suitably romantic note for me to end my grand tour of Scotland with a feminine touch. Join me on my next grand tour of Scotland when I'll be crossing the country from coast to coast.